everybody and welcome to another episode of This Week in Philadelphia Sports where, as you might have guessed it, we go over everything that's happened this week in Philadelphia Sports. Again. If you're new to this channel and you haven't yet subscribed, now is your moment. You have just been drafted with the 21st pick in the NFL draft. You are the new wide receiver, our shiny new toy in this offense. And we're just going to be slinging you up content all day long. We're going to have mock drafts, film breakdowns, and so much more. All we need you to do is run that nine route, catch the subscribe touchdown, and join our offense. Do not make me trade you to Dallas, okay? All the bills, because... Jordan Matthews went there and he said there was nothing to do except have boom boom. So don't, just join, just subscribe, all right? It's easy. So it has been a moderately quiet week for the Philadelphia Eagles on the surface. But when you dig a bit deeper, it's probably been one of the bigger ones they'll have all offseason. Because they've finally finalised everything to do with their coaching staff. From the offensive coordinator to a total overhaul on the medical side of things. And a return of three former players as front office members. They've got it sorted. At the start at the top, we're going to work our way down. Now obviously the role of offensive coordinator is one that has long been questioned by this fan base. And after my... Mike Grove was released just two days after Peterson guaranteed him a job. There was a lot of speculation as to who would take his place. Would it be Jim Caldwell? Would it be a college high flyer? Or would it be a name more familiar? Someone potentially like Mr. Gruden. The answer was none of them. They've gone with a committee approach. Now I know what you're thinking. Many of you will be going, Liam, where was Jim Caldwell? Others will be going, Liam, why weren't you asked to be offensive coordinator? And I'm not going to lie, guys. I mean, Doug called me and I was like, Dougatron, listen, buddy, pal, all right. I've got 15,000 subscribers on YouTube that need this week in Philadelphia sports. And I can't, I can't let them down, Doug, all right. So do you know what I would do? I would go and hire Rich Gangarello, all right. I'd promote Press Taylor. And then what I'd do is I'd probably bring in Andrew Briner, I reckon. I'll, I'll do that, yeah. If you do that, Doug, all right, the offense is set, okay? And the reason for that is you're going to have a lot of outside voices, a lot of a lot of new input, a lot of new ideas, but t I've dropped the phone. I've, I've dropped the phone. <laughs> So Scangarello joins as a special offensive assistant, which is also the role I gave to my ex-girlfriend. We're not together anymore. The best way to sum this up without treading old ground is I really think that the mindsets of both of these guys, so including Bryner and Scangarello, match what the Eagles want to do with Carson Wentz. But I forget the fact that Denver's offense was a dumpster fire for the most part last year and just focus on how it was run. I'm going to do a film room on this, I think. But towards the end of last year, the Eagles offense had to go through a shift because there were no receivers left on the team. But the offense had to undergo a change, okay? And the offense became structured around Carson Wentz. As opposed to Wentz being the distributor to all the playmakers, what we saw was Wentz being the playmaker, getting into open space and letting the rest come to him. And that was massive. It relied on receivers to make adjustments and be intuitive and rely on that bond they had with their quarterback. And that's amazing. What we saw in Denver was a lot of play action to harness the arm strength of Drew Locke. It was the same sort of thing we saw with Andrew Briner. Nick Fitzgerald running all over the place like he was Lamar Jackson. There is a lot to like here of wanting to get their quarterback into open space, of wanting to utilize play action, and a lot of those concepts that became so prominent with the Eagles last year. So I love the moves on the offensive side of the ball. I think Aaron Moorhead has got a great track record so far. He's worked with some really impressive names. Guys like Christian Kirk, Ricky Seals-Jones that have gone on to the NFL level. And I think there's a lot to like there if they can finally get stability and stop there being more turnover than somehow I've had with relationships. Defensive side of the ball, I couldn't tell you why Matt Burke is not only the defensive line coach, but the defensive run game coordinator. They've made a whole new role for him, right? Now I get the idea that maybe, just maybe, it was a little bit too much for Jim Schwartz. Maybe it would have been great to see Schwartz focus on an area of real need, which is the pass defense, and allow the run defense, which is already a strength, to be coordinated by someone else, all right? And Matt Burke, who I know has been around Schwartz for a very long time now, knows exactly how to do that. So I get the move in premise. Still don't know what happened to Philip Daniels though. So I don't want to judge the move before we've seen any action from him. But I don't think there's exactly an impressive body of work outside of a linebacker gig back in Detroit several years ago that really make it an, an impressive one. See, we all know I'm in love with Mark and Manra, but the three names who've actually been brought to the front office this year are Darren Sproles, Brent Selleck and Connor Barwin. And what I love about the last two, Brent Selleck and Connor Barwin, is that they're personnel assistants. They're going to be working hands-on with the young players, helping them transition from the college level to the NFL level. And I love that. If you think of the young players this team has had over the last few years, if we take Carson Wentz, arguably Dallas Goddard, Miles Sanders out of it, 
It's a very raw group. You've got guys like Sidney Jones, Matt Collins, Shelton Gibson, Derek Barnett, all of whom have had their own question marks at some stage or another. Let's not mention Nelson Aguilar just for the sake of sanity here. So if the Eagles are going to focus on building through the draft as they have done in recent years, it makes sense to have veterans who've been on the team, who know the culture, who knows what it takes to really thrive in that and not let it overwhelm you. It's huge. And I think that's a very nice move by the Eagles coaching staff. I think what this has done from top to bottom, from front office to coaching staff, is really instill a sense of accountability and a focus to not let the white noise, which we saw so much of last year, happen again. So I'm a big fan of those moves. I really, really am. Then the Eagles have changed their medical staff. Now a new director of sports medicine, of sports performance, and a new director of player personnel, of course, replacing Andrew Berry, who went back to the Browns for some reason. Tom Hunkeller, who previously worked with the Minnesota Vikings, will be taking the first role mentioned there. It's a nice move. I think, again, it, I don't really know how to evaluate medical staff because when I get man flu, I'm in bed for two weeks and I'm drinking nothing but hot lemon and feeling sorry for myself listening to Radiohead. So I'm not the best person to evaluate that. But the fact that the Eagles have realised that there is clearly a problem when it comes to injuries and longevity and re-injuring and soft tissues and I'm uh, getting a migraine thinking about it. And they've addressed that by shaking up their medical staff. It is absolutely huge. So I love the mindset. Now they did this last year and the year before that and I'm pretty sure the year before that. So hopefully... 18th time's a charm and we won't have another year like we did last year or the you get where I'm going with it. It is worth noting though know, that Hinkele was part of the 2017 Athletic Training Staff of the Year. Ooh, so that can only mean good things. For all, I think this has been a, a fairly strong week for the Eagles. They finally nailed down positions that were beginning to look a little bit rocky. There were so many big names coming and going and not taking the role. There were question marks over Peterson, whether he was right to retain those play calling duties or hand them off to someone else. And this way, we know the accountability is there. If the same problems persist, all fingers get pointed at the head coach. And that's the way it should be. If you want to take on that responsibility, you take the good and the bad that comes with it. I think this is good. They've got some outside views coming in. Some new ideas being pushed into that playbook. I'm excited to see where we go from here. So All or Nothing released on Netflix. And if you can withstand a solid three hours of that content being Angela, Cataldi shouting about the Eagles, then it's a good watch. Alright, I'm three episodes in so far. I'm going to do a big review on this channel, some of the best bits and my overall thoughts on it. If you want to see that, let me know. I would recommend it. It is on Amazon Prime or some dodgy Google forum if you don't. It's a nice behind the scenes look at the Eagles. You end up definitely resonating with some of the players and seeing a different side to them. Like the bromance between Maddox and Dallas Goddard is amazing. And while we know how the story ends, we don't know the ins and outs of the narrative. And I can't wait to see how it all unfolds and hopefully bring you guys some thoughts on that as well. But just in time for Valentine's Day, Carter Hart returns tonight. So at least I'll have someone's heart. <laughs> but in true Flyers fashion, uh, I don't know what's going on. Because one minute they're being absolutely ruined by the New Jersey Devils. And then the next minute they're slapping the Capitals about and dropping seven on them. So... I don't know. I think the return of Carter Hart can only mean good things. They're still sixth in the Metro Division right now and, of course, gunning for that wildcard spot. It's all looking good, but there's got to be some consistency somewhere. As for the 76ers, uh, gee, oh, where do we begin? Try and sum up the Sixers week in, uh, in about 60 seconds, all right, because there's a lot to digest in. They dropped five in a row. I had no idea what happened. Everything looked to fall apart. Joel B looked like he couldn't be asked. Ben Simmons was doing Ben Simmons things, and then the trade deadline approached, and there were a lot of silly rumours, and then Charles Barkley got angry about the 76ers, and Elton Brand went, don't worry about it fam, I've got you, Jonah Bolden's out, Norman Pell's coming, Burke's gone bye bye bye, and Alec Burks and G Rob the third for three second round picks, off we go, the team saved, playoffs are bound, E-I-E-I-E-I-O, up the NBA we go. Then they went out and beat the Bulls, and it was amazing, and Firkin Korkmaz turned into Superman, and he's going to save the team, and Mike Scott is still on the team, and he's shooting the ball, and the ball's bouncing around and it's all going well. Dennis got traded. Ben Bede woke up a little bit and now we're back to square one. Uh, I, 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 yeah, not a clue, guys. It's been a bit of a roller coaster that one. But if you do want the most up to date Sixers coverage, phillysportsnetwork.com. Dream team of David Essa, Zach Chiavalella, and Ricky Amandeo bringing you daily Sixers coverage. What, what more could you want, all right? Are there issues with this Sixers team? Yes. Did the trade deadline fix them? Probably not. They to do with Brett Brown. Probably. Yeah. Have we known this for a while? Yes. But do we love his thick accent? 
Yes. Are we going to moan regardless of what happens? Yes. It's uh, the week of Sixers news in a nutshell. <laughs> As for the Phillies, they didn't do anything. Um, spring training's happening soon, so that's good. Union launched their new kit. Uh, we had some of our Union team go down there to take a look. And look at the sun, they took a picture! That is the most wholesome thing I've ever seen. The Philadelphia Union team all together having a little drink. You love to see it. I mean, the boys. And then John Zapata turned into a model. I don't know where that came from, but I mean, that should be the official image on the MLS Superstore. That's, I mean, woo. Ladies, I know Valentine's Day is coming up, all right? You can follow him on Twitter. His link will be there down below. Actually, no, I think he's got a girlfriend. Let's, don't, don't do that. But the new kit is great. I don't know how I feel about the Adidas, you know, shoulder bits, but it works. And I think it's a nice color and we're going to get one. We will be doing watch alongs for the Philadelphia Union games. If you want to see those, stick around the channel. We'll be live streaming every single Union game with you, watching it on a big screen, going yes when they score, boo when they don't. And that is it for another week of this week in Philadelphia sports. If you enjoyed it, leave your comments down below. If you didn't, Leave your comments down below. From myself, Liam Jenkins, I'll see you next time.